we have a very exciting show for you here today on the Great Scott's Roundtable because we are reuniting the cast of a film that I was introduced to many years ago when it was first in the theaters. That film is The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry. For three best buddies, the summer of 1970 was shaping up to be the best one yet. I think I'm going to ask Tanya. Mm, Dustin's in love. Dustin's in love. There was just one problem. Where are you going there, Dustin? The town bully. He bosses people around and picks on whoever he wants. I'll take this one. Come on, Nick, this is our pizza. It's my turn to play. Come on, Nick, let him finish his game. Here. I wish he was on another planet. Now, a chance meeting. I've seen you in our church many times, haven't I? You're Mr. Sperry, right? Jonathan Sperry. With the most unlikely ally. It's Nick. This is the bully we've been telling you about. Better hide the pizza. We'll change everything. If your enemy takes a piece of your pizza, offer him two. From director Rich Cristiano comes an inspiring story about the bond of friendship and the power of faith. Everything in the Bible is there to make our lives better. Gavin McLeod. The Lord is always with you. Jansen Panettiere. I don't think I can do this. What if she says no? Frankie Ryan Manriquez. Your love bond. I just like her, that's all. Then you're like blind. Alan Isaacson. If I were you, I'd go back down to the diner and try to talk to her. Taylor Boggin. So Dustin is the old timer. This is our good friend, Mr. Sperry. Billy Garno. Is there something you want to tell me? And Robert Guillaume. Do you know who Jesus is, Mr. Barnes? What kind of a question is that? The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry. My friend said to me, you know, you could do a reunion of The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry. To be honest with you, I honestly thought that some of the people who were involved in The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry would be out of my reach. I honestly thought there would be no chance that I could get the cast of that movie together. Well, the Lord works in mysterious ways. What can I say? Today we are here with several members of the cast of The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry. And I'm going to introduce you to them one at a time. You could never do a reunion for The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry if we did not have Jonathan Sperry. This is a gentleman who has a very impressive acting resume. His career spans more than decades. And uh, most people would probably remember him best as Murray Slaughter on The Mary Tyler Moore Show or the captain on The Love Boat. But to me and everybody else here, he will always be Jonathan Sperry. Please say hello to the one and only Gavin McLeod. How are you, sir? Hey, Gavin. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for that introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Now, like I said, you can't do Jonathan Sperry without Jonathan Sperry, and we've got you here. However, Gavin, I must tell you something. If you go by the letter of the law with screenplays, technically, Jonathan Sperry is the title character. He's technically not the main character. The main character would be the person who goes through the dramatic arc, and in the movie, you mentor a young man who is cutting your grass. And this gentleman is an actor who, at the age of 26, has an impressive acting resume. His films include The Perfect Game, Ice Age, The Meltdown, The Martial Arts Kid, and the Nickelodeon film Last Day of Summer. He played the role of Dustin. Please say hello to Jansen Panettiere. How are you, sir? Hey! <laughs> nice little applause there for yourself. Very nicely done. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Now, Dustin has two very close friends. They're kind of the three musketeers of the movie. Sadly, one of them couldn't join us here, but in my opinion, we got the funnier of the two. No disrespect to uh, Alan Isaacson. <laughs> but uh, this gentleman had a very prolific acting career as a kid, appearing in shows like uh, The King of Queens, Blue Collar TV, and uh, That's So Raven. Uh, as an adult, he's moved on to music producing. Would you please say hello to Frank Manriquez? <laughs> The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry is, of course, a story between Jonathan Sperry and a whole bunch of kids in the neighborhood. And for a movie that is full of kids, you actually only see one parent. And that parent is played by an actress whose credits include The Last Castle, Sweet Home Alabama, Gallows Road, and she played Mrs. Sharp in the film. Will you please welcome Mary Jean Bentley. How are you, Mary? Good. Good. And uh, I heard that some people call you MJ. Is it okay if I call you MJ? Yes, it is. That's short for Mary Jean. All right. Now, of course, once you film stuff with all of these actors, somebody has to put all of this together. And we have the editor of The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry here today. This gentleman is a very sought-after editor in the Christian film world. He's got more than 27 editing credits to his name, including four of Rich's five feature films, Mr. Jeffrey Lee Hollis. How are you, sir? Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> very Good nice. To see you. Good to see everyone. 
And last but certainly not least, very prolific Christian film uh, screenwriter and editor Sean Paul Murphy, who has been on my show before, referred to this guy and his brother as the godfathers of Christian film. And to be honest with you, I couldn't agree more. Uh, his previous credits include Time Changer, Unidentified, A Matter of Faith, and the upcoming Play the Flute, the writer, producer, and director of The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry, Mr. Rich Cristiano. How are you, sir? Thank you, Scott. Appreciate you doing this. Oh, no problem. It's nice to have you back here. How did The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry come about i know you wrote it with your brother dave and i think you even told me that um gavin getting involved was part of when the script well, was um getting yeah. developed so why don't you please tell our viewers about that here's how this came about i i had an idea and it was just a simple idea i want to do a movie about a 75 year old man living in a small town that starts talking to these three 12 year old boys to motivate them for the lord using his wisdom but that's all i had and I remember when we were shooting Time Changer, which is where I first met, first met Gavin. And I started thinking in my mind, Gavin McLeod would be really good in this role. So when we were shooting Time Changer, I took him out to eat one night, Italian, of course. And I said, Gavin, I got an idea for a movie about doing a movie about a 75 year old man living in the year like 1970, who starts talking to these three 12 year old boys. And Gavin looked at me and he said, do you remember what you said, Gavin? I think I would say it today. I'm too young for a character. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who's going to play the old man? I said, you. <laughs> and we left it at there. Now, I'm going to bring Jeff in because when, after we did Time Changer, when we were getting ready to release it in the theaters in 2002, we did some behind the scenes um, stuff for, for TV and television to promote the movie. And Jeff and I and Gavin went out to Red Robin. Jeff, you re you remember this better than I do, so you pick up for a second. Well, we the three of us went to went to dinner and uh, people kept coming over to Gavin and asking him, you know, hey, you're, you know, you're, you're Gavin McLeod. And he would go talk to them and everything. And then when that calmed down, Rich, uh, again, uh, Gavin said, what's what's next? And Rich kind of pitched the secrets of Jean this very in more detail. And Gavin said, uh, I'm in, I'm in, let's do it. And uh, then we, then Rich was really off and rolling after, at that point, yeah. I think. So when I started writing the script, it, the, the easiest guy to write was Jonathan Sperry, because I can just envision Gavin saying the lines. So what I did is just wrote scenes. For example, I wrote a scene which we refer to as the cemetery scene. That's the first scene I wrote. Um, I know we needed a conflict here, so I brought a bully into it. So I wrote the scene where the bully meets Jonathan Sperry for the first time. I wrote the ending. I knew I was going to end the movie. And I remember I had 32 pages, and I sent it to my brother and says, this is all I have. And so my brother Dave looked at it. And he gave me the first 16 pages and he brought the element of Tanya into the movie where he had Dustin and Albert and Mark walking downtown and Dustin kind of likes Tanya and he brought that into the script. And so when he sent it back to me, it was now 48 pages, but because my brother started that Tanya storyline, I was able to finish the draft, but that's how the idea came. And it took probably over a year, you know, cause I don't work on scripts every day. I just work as I feel inspired. So that's how that story came together. Now, obviously you said you had Gavin from the get go, but one of the things that we want to find out is how the rest of the actors that we have here uh, got involved. Uh, right. Rich, I'll let you take the lead and um, Jansen, uh, Frank, Matt, MJ, you guys can jump in here when you want, if you want to add anything. <laughs> yeah. All right, so when we went to casting, I worked with Beverly Holloway, who was our casting director. And initially, we were casting the kids as 14-year-olds. And we found somebody that could play Albert, and I found somebody that I thought that could play Mark. And a guy, and we couldn't find Dustin, though, and a guy by the name of Luke Benward came in. And Luke had done a movie called How to Eat Fried Bean Greens or something. I forget what it was called. But he... And he read for Dustin. He was very good. And so we were going to cast him. And the very next day, he got a Disney movie and we lost him. So we were, I had no lead. And so Beverly called in Jansen Penetier. And I will never forget the first time I'm talking to Jansen walks in. He's 12 years old. And I feel like I'm talking to a 20 year old. I mean, this kid is smart. <laughs> And he's talking to me like I'm an adult. And we had a good little conversation. And he got up and he hit those lines. And, I, and, I, and he walked out. I said, Bev, we got a real problem. That kid's fantastic. And he's not going to match these other two guys. So we brought Jansen back in. And we had the older Albert and the older Mark. And it obviously did not work. So Bev says, what do you want to do? I said, we got to lose the two guys. 
this Jansen kid is fantastic to me. He's the kid. And it's funny because I had envisioned Dustin being somebody else. And this is something I always tell the actors, you know, lots of times the actors will say to me, how do you want me to read this? And I'll say, whatever you think is best because their interpretation may be better than mine. Right. So if I watch Jansen play the part, he was going to be our lead. And so Bev says, I got an idea. So who does Beverly call in? Frankie Ryan Manricus. And when we put those two guys next to the other, they were heckle and jekyll. I mean, they were just the perfect <laughs> match. You couldn't have matched it any better. And heckle so, and jekyll, you guys got anything to say about this? Do you remember <laughs> any of this? Maybe that's not the best illustration. Do you even remember? Do you two guys even remember coming in and auditioning for this film? Jansen or Frankie? Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, Jansen oh, and Frankie. We're uh, talking to you guys. Gosh. I remember Beverly Holloway casting. It was nice. There was a little like atrium in there and kind of like chill out and do your lines. Uh, I don't remember going in for the audition, but uh, I think I remember meeting Frankie at the hotel and then we went swimming and became best friends. Frank, do you have anything to, you didn't say, do you have anything to say about this process? Do <laughs> you remember the audition, Frankie? Uh, slightly, yeah, I do. It's I, honestly, I remember pretty much what Jansen said. Like, I remember slight bits and pieces of of uh, meeting meeting her and uh, doing like the casting of it and trying out. But uh, yeah, other than that, I think my first memories were or like going to the super nice hotel that we stayed in in New York. Those, those, that's where like the memories start to begin. I would say. Just so our audience can see these two guys, we're going to take a second. We're going to show you the very first scene of the movie. We will see interacting between Dustin, played by Jansen, and Albert, played by Frankie. What are you stopping for? I'm getting a little nervous. How come? I don't know. He's in love, dummy. I am not, Mark. Come on, let's go. Wait. I need to know if she's there before we go in. You said she's helping during lunchtime all summer. I mean, I think she is. She's been in there three days in a row, so I'm just thinking she does. Her dad's the owner. She's in there. Let's go. And you go look first, just to see if she's there. This is stupid. I do it for you, Albert. All right. Now, let me tell you how Dustin's mom got cast, Mary Jean Bentley. Yeah. And maybe yeah, she can in, help Jump in here, Mary, if you want to. Because she actually, want to tell the story, you flew to Rochester, New York. Gavin was there, and you did the audition between Gavin, myself, and... Um, yeah, well, I got yeah. the... Um, Chad Gunderson, who you were talking about earlier, who produced this with you, he actually um, called me up and said, hey, I got a great opportunity for you. I think you'd be perfect. Um, but here's the kicker. They're only hiring local hires. And I had just so happened to be in Virginia. So I was on the East Coast at the time. My mother was having heart surgery. And so I was by her side and she was all better. And Chad calls me and says, hey, you should fly up for the audition. It, you're really close because I was in Northern Virginia. And I'm from Texas. So I was much closer than I would have been if I were in Texas. So I said, you know what? I'll do it. I'll fly up there on my dime. <laughs> So I flew up just so I could meet Gavin, right? Yes. <laughs> and I had no idea, but apparently Rich wanted Gavin in there for my audition. You know, it's always good to get assurance, you know. And so after you left the room, Gavin says, Rich, you're dumb if you don't cast this girl. She's fabulous. That's his favorite word, you know. <laughs> and um, of course, I did cast MJ. And so that's how she got in the movie. One thing that I think that is kind of a given when you're working on a movie is that, you know, things will go wrong. And one thing Rich told me was the first two days of this shoot was supposed to be just the boys walking around town to kind of get the crew acclimated to the environment and working together. And then Gavin was supposed to come in. And on the third day, you guys were supposed to shoot the scene where he's giving all the kids lemonade. But it ended up raining those first two days and the filming was completely shot. And so the very first thing that you all had to film was the was the kids drinking lemonade with Gavin and the crew had never worked together before. And so that was day one. And not only that, but uh, Mr. McLeod, 
I'm told that getting to the set was a little bit of a chore for you as well. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I flew in from LA to Chicago and I was very excited about going, uh, going to do this film because I loved it from the get go and to work with Rich again was just an honor. And so uh, we're landing in Chicago and we hear we're not landing, there's a big storm and we have to land someplace else. So people were screaming and carrying on. But we managed to, leave, uh, to land. We landed and uh, I went to check for my next flight into Rochester and they said it won't be, nothing will be leaving from uh, this airport this evening. So I'm there wondering what to do I'm by myself. And two people came up to me and they said, aren't you so-and-so? I said, yes, I'm him. And they said, well, we're going to Rochester. Uh, it looks like we have a lot of time on our hands. Would you like to have some company? You're not by yourself. I, th I said, thank you. I think God sent you to me. And so we, we, we got into a cab to go to the Hilton Hotel downtown and the cab driver got out, he came, a cop came over and he said, we want you to be here, you want to go to the Hilton? And we all said, yes. He said, well, it's right there. It's a tunnel, you don't need this car. And he didn't speak English, the cab driver. So we went through this tunnel and wound up in the Hilton Hotel. So there were no rooms to be had and we weren't going out until the next day, any flight. And so, uh, we managed to eat there and I looked over and there was Mr. T. If anybody's familiar with Mr. T, he's a <laughs> fabulous guy and uh, he just <laughs> loves the Lord so much. And he and I go way back and I said, what do you do? He said, I'm waiting to go to LA. I said, I'm waiting to go to Rochester. And so these people were going crazy meeting Mr. T. And so we had the whole night to k kill and uh, so, the people say, we're going to go into the, uh, oh, we're going to go back to the, I said, I, I, I don't want to go back. Uh, so I'll just sleep here on the floor. So I slept on the floor of the entrance to the hill. People were doing it all over. There were no rooms. What were you going to do? And I'd rather do that than go where there were too many people. So the next morning, they were going to fly. And uh, I went to where the flight was to bring me into Rochester. And people start coming and they call them and they call them and they call them. And there's what I said, oh my, I'm not gonna be there, Rich. What's, what's gonna happen? We have to shoot. And I was the last one called. So I had the last seat on the plane and I finally made it. So God got me there. And the next day I ran into Rich, I said, I'm sorry, my voice is a little husky because I've been sleeping on the floor of the Hilton Hotel at O'Hara Airport. And that was the beginning of it all. And then I met the boys and uh, I, I, I just have to tell you tonight, <laughs> just seeing them as young men, uh, it's very emotional to me Aww. because I feel very close to them. Of all the pieces I've done, I've been acting since I was four years old and I'm gonna be 90 as I told you. And I've, I've been blessed to be able to do the things God has given me to do, but nothing has ever affected me more than Jonathan Sperry and to work with these young people. And here they are and they're so beautiful and I just seeing them on camera, it's just has been very emotional to me. Would you like some more, Albert? Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yes, it's very good. Mark? Yes, sir. I made it myself, you know. Thank you. <laughs> and Dustin. No, thank you. No, thank you. You had three glasses yesterday. No, this is enough. He's too busy thinking about his new girlfriend. Girlfriend? She's not my girlfriend. You wrote her a note. So that doesn't make her my girlfriend. Her name's Tanya. Tanya. Albert, she's a girl in our class that works at the diner. Her father owns it. The problem is that Nick likes her too. Quiet, Albert. Nick's a bully. Quiet. I told him I thought it was a mistake. Albert, will you be quiet? What am I doing? You talked. I was just telling. So, it's a delicate situation then? Yeah, I guess so. Jansen, Frankie, you guys got anything to add to that? I mean, <laughs> let, uh, yeah, I'm I mean, I over here. Yeah, not that you, not that you could, I mean, that's pretty hard to follow right there. 
follow right there. But um, was the the scene where Rich was talking about where they had you know they had to shoot that scene first? Was that the first time you guys had met Gavin? I just remember when whenever we all did meet, it was it was literally like a family, and it never felt awkward or or weird. It was literally just so. Yeah, it was it was it was really it clicked it clicked right off the bat, and I remember uh, really looking up to Gavin and just like just he was a great example and a and like a father figure the whole time and it was it was almost like he was living out his character in real life it didn't seem like that transition from okay he's a character Jonathan Sperry and now he's Gavin like he was he is Jonathan Sperry that's yeah. who he is Amen. <laughs> yeah you know it's a blessing because you know for most of my career I lost my hair when I was young in college and so you go to New York trying to hit things so I I wound up playing drug pushers and killers and heads and bobs and things like that. So finally, by Jonathan Sperry is one of the gifts of a lifetime. And uh, uh, for the record, I, Gavin, when I had to put together your intro for this thing, I picked the two pieces that most people would remember you from because your resume is so long. I was like, oh man, how do I sit? How, how, there's no way I'm going to mention. I mean, there's no way I'm going to be able to mention all these. It's very. It's quite impressive. Uh, just real quickly here, I thought that we could maybe um, uh, Okay, ask, Scott, uh, I want to throw something out for a second. Go right ahead. To follow up what Gavin said, and right Jeff can chime in. Frankie and Jansen. See, these guys were young. You two do not realize how good you are in this movie. You just don't. No. Jeff, do you want to comment on that? Jeff's an editor. He's seen tons of actors. Right. You want to make a comment on these two guys' performance in this movie? Well, sure. I mean, I've, I've done other films with kids, and... Um, it's a little dicey sometimes. And um, when I first saw the, the footage come in of these guys, um, these two especially, I was like, wow, you really, because when he said he's going to work with three kids, I'm like, oh no, boy, you better get good kids. <laughs> and these guys are professionals, man. They were, the editor knows who the best actors are who hit every take. And you have, you have four amazing actors right here that they nailed every take. I don't, I don't remember a, even them flubbing at all. They're so professional and they gave me so much to work with. So fantastic job, guys. There was one person who we never got a chance to uh, invite because he's sadly no longer with us. And that, of course, is the gentleman that everybody will forever know as Benson, Mr. Robert Guion. Who's there? Mr. Barnes? Yeah. I would like to mow your lawn. Mow my lawn? Yes, sir. I don't need my lawn mowed. No, sir, you don't understand. I want to do it for free. For free? Yes, sir. Nothing's free. Well, this is, sir. I really want to mow it. I said I don't need my lawn mowed. Jansen, you did, um, I think most of Robert's scenes in the movie were with you. Do you remember anything about uh, working with him? Very pleasant guy. Very sweet. Very Christian. Um, I remember a couple of the scenes that we did when he came into my house to tell me to keep reading my Bible. Uh, he oh. cried several times during his takes. And uh, you could really see that whatever, you know, this, you know, this movie really cut into him very deeply into something that, you know, had happened in his life or several things. And, um, it was kind of eye-opening to see at that age um, something that I wasn't fully aware of at the time, how impactful this film would actually be. And um, it's something that I'm, you know, seeing much more now. But when I was younger, I, uh, you know, I don't know if I really knew what I was looking at. I remember that, Jansen. I remember yeah, I was, that scene. Yeah, I was just about to ask you. You were, you were in that scene as well. You got anything to add to that, MJ? Yeah, I remember he kept choking up and we'd have to cut and he would have to, you know, start again. And I remember looking at Jansen thinking, he's 12 years old. I wonder what he's thinking about all this. Well, I talked to Robert about it because it was hard for us to get the take we needed. And we did use a take that does show some of his emotion, but some of it was way overboard. And what he told me is he kept looking at that 12 year old boy who didn't have a father, and he says every boy should have a father. Oh. And I said, Robert, I wish you would have told me that. I would have put the script girl there so you could have played the scene to her. You know, I would have got Jansen out of there. Oh. Um, 
<laughs> so, you know, obviously Robert had had a stroke. So if you see how he walks and how his hand is, yeah, that's how right. he actually was, which obviously just added to our movie. And it was really a good opportunity for him to display his talent. But I, you, I just can't envision anybody else but Robert. I mean, there's other actors that could have played that role, but he was just perfect. I mean, just to be able to work with him. And like, as Jansen said, he was a quiet, gentle guy. I mean, Robert yeah. was not a boisterous person at all. And I think he was thankful for the opportunity to do some acting. I always say this, actors want to act, right? And I think he was happy to be there. You know, actually, Rich, you just said something that reminded me of something. Again, not on the talking points, but I have a very trigger happy memory. I'd always wondered, and maybe this is the best time to ask you, I'd always wondered, you know, Dustin in the movie, he only has a mom and then he ends up getting mentored, you know, by, you know, Jonathan Sperry. Did you purposely make the character not have a father for that reason? Yes. 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 I wondered about that. I, I didn't, yes, because um, they would say, why isn't the father mentoring and stuff? So I wanted, the whole idea was to try to motivate senior adults that their life can still have an impact. Life doesn't end at 75. And so I purposely just made him a single parent, where a lot of families are single parents these days, right? So, well, and back then, uh, Rich, just, the, we had the war going on, so I yeah. could have easily lost my husband in war. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you, you don't actually go into it much. I think the only time Dustin <clears throat> mentions where his father is is the very first scene he's cutting the lawn for Mr. Bar Barnes, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, interesting. interesting uh, Jeff, I have a question for you just real quickly, if you don't mind. Um, this is an this is an editing question. This is something I've always wondered, and I thought of this after um, uh, Rich told me that uh, you know uh, Robert and Gavin were never on the set the same day. But I think there's at least four or five shots where they're supposedly looking across the street at what each other's doing, and obviously th they were just being good actors acting to nothing. So I mean, when you when you get when you get footage like like uh, Rich, I think you told me that. Uh, Robert was on the set the last couple days of the film and there was like a gap in between when Gavin left and when Robert showed up. So do you like get notes like, okay, Robert's supposed to be looking at Jonathan here. Do you, I mean, how does, when you, when you get foot, how does the, can you speak to that process just a little bit? Yes. When, when you shoot a film, you have what's called a lined script and they, it's literally lines drip, drawn through the script and it says, you know, here's the take 38 a cutaway of Barnes. And you might shoot that on a different day because it's with, it's with Robert Guillaume, and then you shoot out the other thing with Gavin a day earlier or something. But the, the notes are all there on the script, so I know exactly, oh, the 38C is my Robert Guillaume cutaway, and it's all very well organized. That's what a script supervisor does. They make the line script, and the editor really needs that. Otherwise, I'm going, where's the shot of Robert Guillaume? I don't know where to, I don't know what to cut to. Right. So, yeah. yeah. You know, one thing, <laughs> one quick, one's kind of interesting thing. First of all, Jeff was saying, you know, uh, that uh, he couldn't believe that you were going to do a movie with this many kids. And you also have uh, a movie with kids in it where uh, they're eating a lot. I mean, how, Frankie, how much chocolate cake did you actually eat up, eat in that take? Or, did, or were you actually... <laughs> oh, yeah. I, were you no. like high on sugar after that or something? Because <laughs> no. I, I noticed none of the other guys actually got anything. You were stuffing your face in that one scene. We were all stuffing our faces. Me and Jensen went through... <laughs> went through 10, 10 of those things, probably. We were eating it and when, when they weren't even rolling the camera. I remember constantly eating that cake because I love I love chocolate cake in real life. So I was I was all about it. <laughs> I can't blame you. <clears throat> the kids would be amazing because we would shoot. We would start pretty early in the morning, you know, for the crew. We'd be there almost like 630. And so we would shoot for six hours and we break for lunch. So the kids would go eat, and then after they eat, they go out to the field, and they're throwing the football around and running around. It's like, <laughs> we're going to get this energy. I mean, we're dead already. we got to go shoot for six more hours, you know. Now, Plus, you know, one thing – go ahead, Gavin. Go ahead. Since we're talking about food, I would just like to say I applaud the caterers of all the, of all the food I've eaten on movie sets. This was the best and that, that's, a, that's one way to keep a group happy. The food it was Rob. Terrific. His name was Rob, right, MJ? I remember Rob. the caterer. Yeah. I played golf with the caterer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's good. We use him here in Texas. <laughs> the editing room food was terrible. <laughs> good one. Take some, wanna take I some, want to take that up with your wife, Jeff. Yes. I'm getting to, oh, I'm getting to the next question. I love how Rich, every time okay, I do Rob David Rich, the next along. question. Like a true director. Yeah, move on to the next question. I know. Oh, incidentally, before I move on to the next question, 
I shared this with Rich last night. Uh, Frankie and Jansen, you might find this kind of interesting or entertaining. I assume you know what Internet Movie Database is, right? Okay, good. Yeah. IMDb, Jansen. IMDb. IMDb, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And you know it. there are people. You know there are people in this world with nothing better to do than point out, you know, continuity flaws or acronyms in movies and stuff like that. Well, Jonathan has a John. The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry has a grand total of one mistake. Apparently, you guys want to know what the one mistake is? Apparently, the pinball machine that Nick is always pushing you guys off of that brand wasn't invented until 1973. Oh, and it's in a movie oh, that takes place in 1970. Cool. Oh, <laughs> Someone with nothing cool. better to do with their time researched that and found that out. Oh, shame on you, Rich. Let's shame go on. reshoot it. That's funny. <laughs> CGI. We'll do wow. CGI. All right. <laughs> we'll fix Moving it. on. Keep it going here. I'm sorry. I'm just having so much fun. What can I say? Either that or I'm high off the sugar from the chocolate cake I'm eating. I don't know. All right. Um, Blue. What, what I thought we would do right now is um, uh, just uh, – you know, as uh, Rich and several other people have pointed out here several times, it's been 13 years since this movie was shot. So I thought maybe we could go around and you guys could all uh, tell our audience what you're all doing today. Uh, Mr. McLeod, why don't you go first? Well, I have the least to uh, announce probably because uh, I'm in a retirement home and uh, I still work for Princess Cruises. That's been like 34 years. We've gone from two small ships to 20-something major ships. We have a new one coming out soon. Just came out in Italy. They've been working on it for three years. Uh, I, I, which is very surprising to me because of my age and all that, but I get so much fan mail. I mean, I thought it would end after <clears throat> my series was over, but it seems like we're the love boat is in more countries now than it was we were in 94 countries than it was when we went off. And I'm getting mail from countries that I didn't even know even still were there. So I have that and I, I try to also bring in uh, some spiritual inspiration to these people that I write to because I think that's why God has given me the success if you wanna have it but made my dreams come true. And to think that my kids are all healthy, healthy, doing what they want to do with their lives, and my grandkids, we just are so blessed. And I never stop thanking God for that. And uh, in fact, I just sent something off this morning to a wonderful family who happen to be uh, believers. And I send in the Jonathan Sperry booklets that Rich had made up at one particular time with the book of John. And I send this to people when I can tell from the writing that maybe they could use a little encouragement and realize that uh, Jesus is the answer for it all. And so I take that opportunity. I think so it's opened doors for me. This, this movie, which I did in my later years, so they really exist now, uh, has really become the reason I think I was born. Everything else has led up to this and to get the word of God out there and show how God can change your life and give you a purpose if you recognize him as the son of God, that uh, every moment is rewarding. I'm in a place here with over 250 older people, most of them are widows, and it's a wonderful place to be able to talk about God to these people, and that's what I do. I think that's why God has got us here. As a matter of fact, for the first time, we've been under quarantine since March. But tonight, in a couple of hours from now, we're going downstairs to have our first dinner out of this house. And since this started with a man that lost his wife, who we used to have dinner and pray with before the coronavirus hit, and then she died. He's here all by himself, and he's a dear man. We ran into him the other day and he started to weep and we had a chance to comfort him. And so we're having dinner with him tonight. This is a big deal to be used that way because uh, when we talk about how I, I relate so much with Dustin when he was young because I lost my father when I was 13. And so I never had anyone in that supervising kind of role to advise me and tell me except for school people. And I so I know how vacuous life can be without a father. And uh, so I've tried to be a father to my own kids. And now I'm like a grandfather or a papa to many, many people. I'm very grateful 
for every moment and uh, to see these young mentions, these kids. Do you ever go to Andy Walhall's studio when you're in New York? Do you ever go down there to see his artwork at all? Actually, nice Maybe. segue. Why don't we? Yeah, we love that. Yeah. Nice segue. Jansen, why don't you go next? Because I know that you're, you're an artist now, correct? Uh, what have you been up to these I, days? I, uh, I paint. I paint every day. And I paint for like eight hours a day, generally. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something, it's a major escape for me. And uh, I'm able to let my inner demons have a stage to play on that is cathartic and uh, financially rewarding to some extent. And, uh, you know, that's, yeah, I luckily, I'm lucky. I fell in love with something. And I actually saw some of your work on Instagram. It looks very, it looks very good. Would that be the best place for people if people want to see some of your work? Is there a place they can check it out? Sure, absolutely. Um, if you Google me, or if you are, if you're on Instagram and you uh, type in J R P A N E T T I E R E, so J R Panettiere, um, you'll see some art. But in my bio, there is another link to um, a different uh, Instagram, and that's my art account. Awesome. It's called Art Pylon. Awesome. But enough about me. Frankie's making music. Yes, Frankie, <laughs> yes. I love how you're each segueing to, to each other here. This is very good. Yes. Talk about that, Frankie. Actually, do you prefer Frank or Frankie? Because you're... Thank you. Thank you, Jansen. Uh, no, Frank, either one. And fine. we have Frankie. Yes. Hey, wow, thank you. I'm segueing you next, Mary, so... Yes. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I make music now. Uh, my name is Band-Aid. That's like my artist name, but it's spelled differently. It's spelled B-A-N-D-A-D-E. And so uh, I make music under, under that brand. So uh, I'm also writing for other people too. So I've been, like Jansen just said, I, I found something that I really, I really fell in love with. And, and I'm really blessed to, uh, to be able to use that platform to, to hopefully um, glorify God and, and, and let that be um, kind of like the foundation of why I do what I do. So, is there a platform where people can hear some of your work? Yeah, you just uh, type in my name, Band-Aid, into Spotify or anything, and, and you can find it there. All right, awesome. Very. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but so what I'm doing now is I run a studio called Fort Worth Studios, because I'm here in Texas, and we do movies with a message, mm -hmm. and uh, we do documentaries. And um, I also teach at our church. I teach the sixth graders in Sunday school. Um, so I'm really passionate about what you were saying, Gavin, about just giving back to the youth. Yeah. Oh, hey, Rich, I never told you this. But anytime somebody asks me, Scott, why do you like the movie The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry? I say three reasons. I cut my grandparents' grass every, every, every week during the summer. I was bullied as a kid myself, and I love pizza. So that's it. <laughs> I, so I find the movie I find the movie very relatable. So it is. It, it's yes, timeless, it is. Rich. It's timeless, and it's it's yeah. a good tool to show kids. Yes. With that, uh, Mr. Hollis. I paint for nine hours a day. I make music and documentaries <laughs> in a rest home. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in case uh, you didn't figure it out, he's also moved into stand-up comedy. Is that right? Uh, I do stand-up comedy now. Uh, but uh, right as I, we finished this film, I, I started a six-year stint at NBC. And then I've been at CBS for seven years. I write, produce, and edit promos, which are like type of commercials for um, various CBS shows, like I'm working on Big Brother right now. And uh, that's how I pay the bills. But working on Christian projects like this is how, you know, I, I pay it forward and I tell people about the Lord. And it's, it's a really a blessing. So, yeah. Working for CBS is your tent making, right? There you go. Exactly. And no, look, who just, look who just popped oh, up here, popped ladies up. and gentlemen. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, how hey, are you? Oh. Tanya. Bailey Garnell played Tanya. Hi, hey, everyone. <laughs> I was just getting to it. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, <laughs> how are you, Bailey? I'm doing well. How is everyone doing? Good. Well, actually, this is perfect timing because uh, everybody um, was uh, just talking about uh, what they've been up to since the film. So since you just got here, why don't uh, you, you tell us what you've been up to? Cool, yeah. Hi, oh my gosh, this is so great to see everyone again. It's been so long. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm in LA now, um, which I've been in LA for a little over five years at this point. I moved out here right after school and I'm working in music. I'm at a music licensing company called APM and um, I'm actually licensing music for movies and shows. We might pop in a quick scene so you can see the first time that Bailey, who played Tanya, the first time we see her in the movie, it's a scene where Albert and Dustin go in to talk to her with Mark. Hey guys. Hi, Tanya. Hey, Tanya. What can I get for you? Um, I'll have a hot fudge sundae. Okay, one hot fudge. I'll have a banana split with two strawberries and one chocolate. No pineapple syrup? No, I don't like pineapple. Neither do I. Dustin. Oh, um, I'll get a hot fudge Sunday too. Okay, coming right up. What are you doing talking so much with my girl? What do you mean? You know, talking to her about the pineapple and stuff. You talked to her more than I did. Someone had to. Bailey, do you have anything that you would like to quickly share before we go to what's going to be the last question here? I mean, I would just say that the experience on set for this movie was, um, you know, really lovely and enjoyable and everyone was so kind, um, you know, as someone that, you know, really wasn't familiar with film being on set all that much. I'd only been in one project previously and I was telling Rich I actually haven't done any acting since. Um, it is so special, you know, like not everyone gets the opportunity to work alongside such amazing people in um, a, such a cool setting. Um, and I, I remember in particular as a kid really enjoying um, costumes uh, that, you know, the period piece kind of, you know, gave us the opportunity to wear. So um, yeah, it was so, it was many years ago, but I, my mom um, fortunately memorialized a lot of that in a uh, photo album that I still have and I still uh, look at pretty frequently actually. All right. uh, I do want to say this too. Gavin and I have talked about this film a lot and I have kept him in touch with what's going on. I haven't been in touch with the actors as much, but you guys just don't realize how this film has touched lives and touched hearts. And it's partly because of your performances. You guys were young and you don't, you don't realize what you did here. I mean, I'm so grateful and thankful for what you guys did for me. You know, I can, I'm not an actor. And so I need my actors to pull off the roles. And, you know, it's Jansen in particular, because it's an honor to be a lead in the movie. There's only one lead. And if your lead's no good, your movie's no good. I don't care how good everybody else is. If the lead's no good, you got no film. And, you know, and I put a $900,000 budget in the hands of a little 12-year-old kid named Jansen Penetier, and he must deliver. I know Gavin's going to deliver. I need Jansen to deliver. And you did, my friend. I'm telling you, Jansen, you are so good in this movie. You are so good. <laughs> and we've captured you That's and Frankie son. and Bailey. <laughs> we've captured you guys for history at, at a young, innocent age. I realize life throws things at us, and you guys have moved on when your lives and understand. But hopefully there will be a day years from now where you'll sit and watch Jonathan Sperry again when you were a little kid. And you guys really pulled it off, boy, and I applaud you for it. And this film has a lot of life left. In fact, probably now today, because of the digital more. network, more people are seeing this movie today mm -hmm. than have ever saw it. it. Rich always starts the film by saying, you gotta please the Lord first. And then if you please the Lord, the Lord's gonna use your film. And the, the Lord has used this film. He doesn't need us. The Lord doesn't need us, but he lets us be a part of it. And we're blessed to be a part of it. My experience on Secrets of Johnson's Ferry was so new and different from what I had experienced prior to that. Um, Cause I've been on, you know, large movie sets, but little bitty parts. But when you talked about the rain, I remember the whole set, like going down on their knees, praying like, okay, we need sunshine. We need sunshine today. And we got it. Mm. And I was like, I remember repeating that story to people years later. And I said, it was the most blessed time. This has been a very special, the movie has always been special to me. It, uh, it reeks of honesty and of God. And that's about the best I think you can do in this industry. Uh, I thank God for blessing me to allow me to work with all of you where he has. 
and I think the, f the lighting on my picture here sucks. So if you don't mind, I'm going to wear some hair for the first time and be a little warmer. I don't know. Everybody has beautiful colors, and I'm. Why don't they do something in this joint? Anyway, I love you all, and I remember your parents and your families and things from that experience, and especially that food on the truck. Rich, <laughs> love you, Jeff. Great work, and it's nice to be with you, great Scott, and that's the best waitress in the world. I'm a waitress. <laughs> smiling at us right now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What an honor to, I've never done this kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, oh, it's yeah. never over till the fat lady sings, I suppose. And uh, <laughs> there's a lot more to do. You know, I was, when I was on this film, I was a diehard atheist. And then years later coming back to it as a Christian and really knowing what that means and knowing uh, the power and influence that Christ's consciousness can have in your life. Um, mm -hmm. It makes this movie so much more of a time capsule and something just almost impossible to grasp. Um, something very special happened. And I got to be a part of it, even though I didn't know I was a part of it. Mm. So I'm very grateful to for that. I just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, I think this whole this whole thing is really really cool because I haven't seen literally any of any of you guys since literally the day we left. I mean, I think maybe we we saw each other when the movie came out, but that's pretty much the same thing because um, we were so young. But I just think that it was really cool because it wasn't, it didn't ever feel like we were shooting a movie. It felt like a big family. And like, I gen genuinely do remember that. I remember doing everything with everybody and it was just like a big hangout. And then when it, when it was time to work, it was time to work. But like, even the work was fun because in between scenes, we were just being ourselves. It didn't feel like we were ever like, you know, acting. So it was a great experience and it was really fun to be able to, uh, go across the country for six weeks as a little kid and and just hang out in the summer. And I hope that we can uh, all keep talking and doesn't, it's not another 14 years or however long it's been yeah. to, until we talk again. So, yeah. I would echo what Frankie was saying. My, from my time on set, I, I do, it was many years ago, but I do remember you know, getting to know everyone, um, cast and crew. And again, just the kindness, the fun that we had. Um, and yeah, I'm just very grateful to have had this opportunity and grateful for this moment now. Um, so cool, never thought that we'd be back here kind of doing this. Um, so I very much appreciate, Rich, you, you know, creating a space for this to happen. Um, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. I just well, want to finally say, I just want to finally say to my actors, I love you guys. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to try to keep those big fat residual checks coming. <laughs> but <laughs> Gavin, first of all, this project started with you, Gavin, without you, you, you made, I did two movies with you, Time Changer. And your performance in Time Changer, Gavin, is flawless. I've told you that many times. You're so good in that movie. And then for you to do Jonathan Sperry, a totally different character and just play him bring them to life. There's been so many people that have been encouraged by the Jonathan Sperry character. Um, I think both of I want to be like Jonathan Sperry when I get older, and you've said that many times. Um, but it started with you, Gavin. The fact that you did the movie just gave it instant credibility. And just, again, you know, you young kids, when you guys were young, but Jansen, Frankie, Bailey, just a pleasure working with you, you know. The one thing about shooting movies with kids is kids like to goof around. You know, that was our only issue. Whenever we had them by themselves, they were great. But when they're all together, you know, it was just, but you I guys are- universal I know, disagreement with that. They're all shaking their heads no, right? Yeah. No. You guys, you know, from my vantage point, you guys are always special to me. You're like celebrities to me because you brought the movie to life. And, you know, we're so passionate about our films and we distribute it every day. I've lived with this movie for years and can, will continue to never, you know, I'm looking at the little slogan on the DVD and it just says it all. It says, what he teaches them will last forever. 
Mm. And that's the thing about this movie. You know, this movie does have purpose. You know, people have come to know the Lord and received eternal life before the, because of this movie, because of your performances. So hopefully that gives you a sense of reward. But thank you guys for doing this. It meant a lot to me. I know it meant a lot to Gavin mm -hmm. and to Jeff Hollis, who edited this movie. And he works, Jeff works for about 20 cents an hour when he works with me. Um, you know, the way we edit, I let Jeff edit the scene any way he wants. And then I come in and make the changes that I want to see. But the advantage is Jeff always does things that I never think of. So we get a better movie that way. And uh, Jeff put in the hours and the hours and the hours to pull this together and did a super job. And he's edited four of my films. And we have an excellent, I just want to pay homage to Chad Gunderson who produced this movie with me. We love Chad. Jasper Rando, who did the music, he's outstanding. Matt Waters, who does the sound design. Stephen Kujay, who did costuming. Um, James Cunningham, who was the production designer. And Philip Hearn, who shot the movie. We love these guys, and they did a super job. So thank you, everybody. We thank Scott for putting this together. And, um, you know. Well, you know, what's, what's interesting is that I should say, as I sit here hearing all these stories, I just kind of say to myself, you know, how the heck did I end up the host of something like this? Because I'm a, I'm a low rent magician from Massachusetts who has three IMDb credits who, um, <laughs> God can use anybody, Scott. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you want to, you want to know what these round tables are? I tell people this all the time. These round tables are the lemonade I made out of the lemons that is COVID-19. This is just, I just, I just started doing them and Rich's movie Un unidentified was the first one I did a re reunion for, and I didn't realize how many people were going to want to do them. And uh, someone here, I won't mention who, won't mention who, um, asked me, you know, what's the purpose of doing this? Well, um, you kind of all just saw it because, uh, you know, reconnecting people and seeing all you guys be so happy to see each other again after all these years is what I get out of this by hosting these. So uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. And I think that um, we'll say to all our viewers, thank you very much for watching and uh, check out The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry. Christianmovies.com and here comes the trailer. Good to see you, everybody. For three best buddies, the summer of 1970 was shaping up to be the best one yet. I think I'm going to ask Tanya out. Mm, Dustin's in love. Dustin's in love. There was just one problem. Where are you going there, Dustin? The town bully. He bosses people around and picks on whoever he wants. I'll take this one. Come on, Nick, this is our pizza. It's my turn to play. Come on, Nick, let him finish his game. Here. Oh. I wish he was on another planet. Now, a chance meeting. I've seen you in our church many times, haven't I? You're Mr. Sperry, right? Jonathan Sperry. With the most unlikely ally. It's Nick. This is the bully we've been telling you about. Better hide the pizza. We'll change everything. If your enemy takes a piece of your pizza, offer him too. From director Rich Cristiano comes an inspiring story about the bond of friendship and the power of faith. Everything in the Bible is there to make our lives better. Gavin McLeod. The Lord is always with you. Jansen Panettiere. I don't think I can do this. What if she says no? Frankie Ryan Manriquez. Your love bond. I just like her, that's all. Then you're like Brian. Alan Isaacson. If I were you, I'd go back down to the diner and try to talk to her. Taylor Boggin. So Dustin is the old timer. This is our good friend, Mr. Sperry. Billy Garno. Is there something you want to tell me? And Robert Guillaume. Do you know who Jesus is, Mr. Barnes? What kind of a question is that? The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry.